Hello everyone. It is a beautiful, beautiful Wednesday night um, here in Napa Valley. I'm here at Press and we just finished up a really great night here in the wine cellar. We had a dinner back here and cracked open probably one of my favorite bottles of wine here on the list. Um, something a little bit more obscure, something that if you aren't um, super, super familiar with Napa Valley and all of the wines that Napa Valley produces. You may not have heard of this producer, but it is definitely something you should know. So this is Philippe Tongi, uh, and I'll give you a little history on Philippe Tongi. Philippe Tongi was one of the most important, is one of the most important winemakers here in Napa Valley. He came here in the 50s. He actually made a very early vintage of Mayakamas in 1959. He made the Mayakamas Chardonnay and uh, studied under Emile Pinot in, uh, in France, came over here, and then he started working his way up um, through a bunch of different wineries and vineyards. He most famously made probably what is considered the greatest Napa Valley wine ever to be made, the most ex one of the most expensive wines in Napa Valley, which is the 69 Chapelet. So Monsieur Tony, uh, Tony, I can never say it correctly, uh, Philippe Tony, uh, he made the 69 Chapelet. He made uh, really early 70s Chapelets. He then went on to make, uh, he made cuvées on for a time, and then he started his own winery up on Spring Mountain, and that's what you see here. So he makes two wines from that property, uh, two still red wines from that property. He also makes a sweet dessert wine, which I believe they discontinued a few years ago, uh, called, Katog we call it Katogni, but Katogni. Um, this is one of the most important wines here in Napa Valley for a number of different reasons. Uh, one, because it is the wine that you put in front of any European wine drinker and they immediately drop their jaws and ca like cannot believe that this wine came out of Napa Valley. So his style is definitely more old world. It's definitely a little bit more restrained. Um, his wines take a ton of time to be able to uh, to be enjoyable. They, they recommend uh, 20, actually you can even see um, aged at the winery 20 years. One of the more fascinating things about this is his, uh, his demographic, the, the people that were buying his wines were not from the United States for a really, really long time. It, that has started to change a little bit thanks to a great score from uh, An Antonio Galoni. Hi. Um, Galoni from Venice gave him a really high score. I think he may, may have even given him 100 points. And that sort of sent his reputation out into um, the non-geek world, like my world, out into the universe. And now uh, it's sort of become a household name, so to speak, for again, those in the know when it comes to Napa Valley wines. I will say for 100 point wine, this is not again what you think of when you think of 100 point wines. It is a beautifully well-crafted made wine, but it's not what you think of as far as being big and opulent, it's quite the opposite. So um, that's a little bit of history about him. Stylistically, you could always expect these wines to be really, really tight in their youth. I do not recommend drinking these wines with less than 10 years. In fact, I'd even maybe say less than 20 years. They are just incredible. They're like, it's like drinking Bordeaux. Um, he uh, makes the wine up in Spring Mountain. Sorry, my battery's about to die. Uh, makes the wine up in Spring Mountain. His daughter, Lisa, is heavily involved um, and sort of has taken the reins. He's uh, gotten a bit older as of late. If you haven't listened, uh, or if you're a podcast listener, I highly, highly recommend the podcast that he did for the Guild of Sommeliers. Uh, Guild Som is how you'd find that on Apple iTunes um, and just look for Philippe Tongi. It's an incredible podcast. He talks about his whole journey uh, and is much more um, cohesive and, uh, and clear than I'm being right here at 11 o'clock at night. So let's get into the wine. This is a Magnum of 1993 Philippe Tongi. Really, really hard wine to find. Uh, almost impossible. Um, not the most expensive bottle in the world, but definitely a rarity, a little bit of a unicorn. <sighs> I'm so excited. Went to a good home tonight too. This um, this went to a group back here. They all work at Maya Comas, a really similarly styled vineyard and of course uh, a place that Philippe Tongi made wine a few years ago. Now when I opened this wine, I, I was a little nervous because it was really, really green, a little bready. Um, so it had a little bit of that, like, that we call it like that Bordeaux funk, a little bit of that barnyard, a little bit of that, um, it's not basement, but there is like a little bit of a, a funkiness to it. Sometimes it can smell a little like cheese, sometimes it can smell um, even like dirty socks, which is really gross. But this had just like a touch of bread on it. It seems to have diminished after it's been decanter for a little while. 
but you do get, I called it the green monster when I, when I opened the wine because it was just like this gnarly kind of beast of a wine. It was really green and savory, had a little bit of that green bell pepper, a lot of the green bell pepper, um, which Cabernet, can, Cabernet Sauvignon can often have. We call it pyrazine, and that's the compound that gives you that green bell pepper smell and taste, and it's, it's everly present in Cabernet Sauvignon. It's just a matter of ripeness and style and whether or not you allow those phenolics to develop past the green pyrazine and i'm sure i'm not technically saying that correctly but that's sort of how i interpret it in my own mind so getting a ton of that here spring mountain where this wine comes from uh, is typically a, a cooler more wet rainy eva it the ripeness up there uh is is a little bit harder to achieve in fact we were talking about that with the guys from mayakamas today um, and their winemaker and just talking about achieving ripeness in a really, really cool climate. And the interesting thing is I actually, I had asked him what I think ripened faster. Um, sorry, I want to answer this question. Can you get this in wine.com? You you can, obviously not this vintage, but you can get Tony every now and then on wine.com. I think these wines are a steal. They're still not that expensive by comparison. I think, you know, they're going for like 150, 200 bucks a bottle. So pricey, but not like stupid expensive. But these are wines you're gonna wanna lay down. So don't buy them young unless you plan on cellaring them. Otherwise, I would look for them on the second market and try to find something older. Um, Anyway, as far as ripeness goes, uh, Maya Comis may be ripened a little bit a little bit more evenly this year and maybe a little bit faster because they sit above the fog line. This does not, this is a little bit lower, so ripeness is, is definitely an issue for these guys down here. Um, and I think a lot of what's happening in this glass is an issue with ripeness. It's a little bit green, it's a little bit more savory, and it's got a little bit more of those um, those spices going on. It's fruit is not the first thing you get when you stick your nose into this glass. And I think it's really interesting for anyone who thinks they know Napa Valley wine and thinks it's more of a homogenized reason to get their nose in this glass because it's just so, so vastly different than anything else you will ever have smelled from here. And I, I include Chorus and Dunn, all of these other old school producers that people think of. This is just in a totally separate league of their own. It just, it's mind blowing every time you open it. So, and I haven't even gotten them palette yet. Okay, on the palette. Mm. Jesus fuck, that's good. Wow. That wine is so tight. This wine could age for 30 more years and it still wouldn't even crack the surface. So much acid, so much depth. And what I love is a lot of times you get these wines that are kind of green, low alcohol. They don't list the alcohol on the label um, for a number of different reasons. Legally, he doesn't have to. Um, but the, this is not a high alcohol wine, but it is completely developed, meaning you get this round, complete center core of fruit, but it's not overwhelming and it's just a perfectly, perfectly well-made wine. Um, I'm always blown away by, by what he is able to achieve on Spring Mountain. Mm, tannins just like incredible really still grippy grippy tannins acid fruit you know the fruit quality is that of Bordeaux it is that of Bordeaux in that era it is savory it is it's almost tart but it's not it doesn't feel underripe at the same time which can be a little bit um, contrarian in some ways but this wine just works and if I were blind tasting this I'm true. I really don't think I'd get to Napa Valley. I really don't. Mm. Really, really awesome wine. If you look at the color of this wine, it's just, it's incredibly reflective. It's incredibly bright. Um, these came just directly from the winery, so they really haven't moved very much. And I will say, when it comes to old Napa Valley wines, provenance is everything. Um, so these wines don't always taste as great as they do outside of here if they've moved around quite a bit. Um, you know, I've had the first vintage of this wine, which is 1980, well, first commercial vintage, which is 1983. Um, a really cold, wet, rainy vintage. And stylistically not that different from some of the other wines, but another tough as nails wines. And I, I will be very curious to see these wines 15, 20 years down the road when they've hit that peak maturity and we still haven't seen that yet. Um, you'd have to go back to something like Cuvezon or something like the 69 Chapelet or that era of Chapelet's when he was making the wines to really, really feel what those wines do uh, as far as their development. And we are just not there yet. This is just such a lovely, lovely wine. Um, 
Not recommended for people who love super, super amounts of fruit. Not recommended for people who love high octane, round, viscous wines. This is for someone who loves Bordeaux, Burgundy, um, Italy, uh, all of those like really more restrained, cooler climate. Um, like I'm talking Northern Italy, not, I'm not talking about Tuscany, I'm talking about Piedmont. Um, and I'm talking about Bordeaux, things that are a little bit cooler. Um, wow, I have a lot to say about this wine tonight. Uh, I think that I must like it. <laughs> um, one more sip, because I just can't waste it. Gorgeous. Taking on a little bit of a mushroom quality now, starting to soften. That's the thing with these wines. It sort of does the opposite thing that uh, that big high alcohol wines do. It, it doesn't it doesn't layer on. It almost like layers off a little bit. So all of the things that you felt initially that really kind of abrasive acid, abrasive tannin, it starts to kind of back off. Um, which Bordeaux producers would you say the Tony similar to? Awesome question. Um, I um it's tough as nails like uh the one all the way up not uh, uh mont rose um it's definitely more structured like a poyac so something like uh like a latour or lafitte it's just got that like tough as nails graphite feel to it it's significantly more green than both of those um, it doesn't have the lush softness that like a Margot has. Um, it's not as even keeled as like Saint Julien, um, but it does have like a masculine intensity to it. I just would say if you were to go all the way north to one, I think it's Montrose, that's like really, really far north, like as far north as you can get. Um, that to me is a little bit more similar because it's, it just, they're, they're by the water. So it, um, it's a little cooler there. So the wines don't get so much ripeness. Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, I think Lafitte would be probably the closest. Um, I was just thinking Margot when you said not Margot. Definitely not Margot. Margot for me always has this like really soft lavender, really floral, really elegant, really um, a, a softer touch. What else makes a wine age worthy? I know that big acid, big tannin wines can age well, but not every big acid. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah, well, um, Thanks for all the comments, guys. So I'm, try I'm trying to get to all of them. Um, you know, that's that's maybe for another video. I'll I'll touch on it tonight. Um, the real the real answer to that question is we don't know. We don't know why certain wines age better than others. Um, I I think, in my opinion, I think um, some of it is acid, and a lot of it is tannin, and a lot of it is uh, varietal. Not all varietals are capable of aging. Um, typically, uh, you know, complete wines, wines that have balance from the get-go, they have great fruit, they have great acid, they have great tannin, great structure. Um, those are the wines that typically age really, really well. Um, I have always found that wines in hotter vintages usually suffer earlier, so cooler or more moderate vintages are always going to be more of my long-lasting wines. Now, there are always exceptions. There's always outliers in that situation. So um, vintages like 78 and 74 here, which are a little bit on the warmer side, there's a lot of disparaging, disparaging feelings about um, about those wines and those vintages. So there's not one, like, like anything in wine, there's not one clear-cut feeling about it. But I do think, you know, really, really well-made wines from the beginning that have a backbone, that have structure, that have depth and complexity are more likely to age well. Um, but that starts to get into the territory of like, what, you know, what, what is delicious to you is not delicious to someone else. What I love about age is not what someone else loves. So it, it gets into this argument about, um, you know, whether or not you love 50s burgundy or not, because, you know, to me, it's more about the novelty of it. It's not about the flavor. I think flavor development for a lot of wines happens um, at 30 years, depending on the region. I probably should not even like say that because it's just going to like have a whole slew of comments. Anyway, I'm, I'm digressing and it's late. So, um, thank you guys all so much for watching. This is a much longer video than I intended, but, uh, I guess a 93 Magnum of Philippe Tongi sort of calls for that. So thanks for hanging out with me tonight. It's been real. If you liked this video, obviously give it a like and, um, I will see you all tomorrow. Night, night. Thank you guys. Yeah.